Welcome back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Bitch Mob ENT Podcast, the best sports podcast in New Jersey. We got the big four on the night. We got Miles Davenport is in the building, Greg Sinsmere is in the building, and CJ Cincinnati's very own is in the building. How y'all fellas doing tonight? Yeah. We're, keep, we're pushing right now. I feel good, man. We're good. We're good. I want to start off with this because we've been talking about the Eagles, and I know Miles is a uh, pseudo Eagles fan. And it was a recent press conference that I just found. It was absolutely hilarious, and I think this shows on what's going to go uh, with the Eagles for the rest of this uh, off season. We're going to have some questions. Coordinator is going to be in charge of the offense, and the defensive coordinator is going to be in charge of the defense. What is your role going to be? The head coach. Not the head coach of the offense, not the head coach of the defense, not the head coach of the special teams, but be the be the head coach of the football team. Just wanted to start off with that one to show hey. where uh he, he gotta cut all that out. He got he gotta cut all that attitude out. Mm. You you can't you can't be getting an attitude with the media because you don't want to do your job, right? You you can't get mad for the media asking questions about the the status of your role going forward when you look like you did the second half of the season. When you start off 10 and 1 and then fall apart the whole second half of the season and you straight up tell the media that if you knew what was wrong you would fix it. You can't try to get cute in 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 and try to get smart with the media when when they ask valid questions about the status of your role going forward. I, I don't like how he handled all that. To me, I think it was it was hilarious though, because they the you could tell the media is kind of done with Seriano over there. They act with it like, so y'all got rid of the OC, y'all got rid of the defensive coordinator. What, what exactly? Are, what's your role? What, what are you doing? <laughs> and he comes up with, "I'm the head coach of the football team. I'm not the head coach of the offense. I'm not yeah. the head coach of the defense. I'm the head coach of the football team." Yeah. Um, he's on borrowed time. No, he's on borrowed time. If they, 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 that team is the team that we expect to win a championship or people expect to win a championship. And if he doesn't pull it off next year, I think he's, he's out of there. He understands that. It, it, all you hear is a frustration in his voice. You hear a man who's desperate to try to save his job. Um, and, you know, I, I think the media is going to get real nasty. He's going to get tough for him this upcoming year. I'm not saying the Eagles will struggle again, although I'd love to see it happen. I've all, I always welcome bad Eagles seasons, but I just, you know, I, I, I think you, what you see is a guy who's starting to feel the pressure of what it me, what it what it's actually like to be a coach who's coaching a football team that isn't perfect for once. Because it was easy when they were steamrolling football teams last year, but when you get a little adversity, that's when things get tough. Um, and for them to have lost almost every game for for a two month span after going ten and one, that's that's a pretty bad ending. I'm surprised he kept his job honestly after that. It's the way they went out this year. Uh, the, the the record doesn't tell the story. Now, we're going to have all offseason to talk about the Eagles. I just want to start off with that, just a little humor, because uh, when you look at the Eagles, we're mentioning, you know, why does he still have a job? One thing we'll talk about this offseason, I think that's because Howie Roseman wants to be in a position where he gets most of the, the glory and the praise. You saw what happened. Man went to the Super Bowl, won a Super Bowl, Doug Peterson, and got fired him the next year because too much of the shine was on Doug Peterson and not – Howie Roseman. So I think this interview shows us that Sirianni really is just a talking figure. He's a headpiece. He's just there to be there. This is a puppet for Howie Roseman. But we'll we'll discuss that later in the offseason. We'll, we'll talk about that. Now, funny stat. We got playoff championship weekend. Start off with this. We're going to talk about, of course, Ravens, Chiefs. Now, the Chiefs, when you talk about the Ravens, Anytime you mention the Ravens, the one way that they say to get to Lamar is to rush him, get pressure on him. Lamar this year, actually under pressure, has only thrown one interception and has led in yards per attempt against the Russ. Will it be a bigger challenge scoring on the Ravens or stopping the Ravens offense? Scoring on the Ravens, in my opinion. I don't know what you guys think. I think scoring on, scoring on the Ravens will be tougher. Uh, the, the defense is, is the strength of that team. That defensive coordinator is one of the hottest uh, coordinators out there. He should be, you know, he's probably one of the guys who are 
were more likely to get a head coaching job sooner rather than later. And it's because of what he does to defenses. He's taking, excuse me, offenses, opposing offenses. He takes opposing offenses like the Shanahan offenses. And, you know, what he did to the 49ers on that Sunday night was ridiculous. Or Monday night, excuse me. The Monday night game was ridiculous. And I, he, he just has a, he, He's really exotic in his blitz packages. They, they cover well. Their linebacker core is really good. They're fast out on the sideline. They tackle. They secure tackles. They don't miss. Um, they're they're going to be tough to beat. And you're talking about as great as Mahomes is, and he, he's great. You know, the receiver play hasn't been amazing. Rasheed Rice has been good, been better, getting better. But, you know, who are you relying on outside of that? MVS? You know, who else? Like, if those guys don't make the plays when they're there, they won't be – they're, they're going to lose because there's not going to be a lot of them to begin with. So – I would say it's going to be harder to score in the Ravens because the Ravens defense has probably been the best defense in the league for the last two months. And we're saying like bigger challenge for the chiefs, right? Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know. I mean, they still got the best quarterback in football. So I think he's finding ways to win with, uh, I guess, limited crowd of receivers to throw to. So I think they can, make plays against this this Ravens team. Like, they're missing Marlon Humphrey. Who knows if he's going to play. Um, but Mahomes is Mahomes. He finds ways to beat teams like this. So I would lean towards, yeah, the bigger challenge would be stopping the Ravens offense, hopefully. Um, like, I think Lamar is in such a different place at this point in his career with – finally getting comfortable in this new offense. They finally got weapons. And when you see them out there, even last week, that first half, they were rusty. They hadn't played in two weeks. And that's kind of usually what happens. You need to kind of get your feet under you. Um, but then second half, like, he got it rolling. Like, he's he knows he doesn't have to run every single play. He, he's smart with the way he runs and avoids hits and all that stuff. And He's got weapons. He doesn't, like, focus on one guy. He's not, like, one of those quarterbacks who's going to just feed somebody like Devontae Adams or Justin Jefferson. He's got OJ, OBJ, Zay Flowers. He's got Mark Andrews coming back. So I think it's going to be real tough to, to stop this Ravens offense. I mean, they've been the best team in football, and they've kind of mowed down every team in their way. And, I mean, if you look at it, they ran through the 49ers like it was nothing. And that's probably the other best defense in the league. So I think the way they're playing, yeah, they're, that offense is a lot harder to stop right now. Miles, to your point, too, I think, like, Lamar spreading the ball around and what he's been able to do with the receivers that he's had at his disposal, he makes someone look like a different star every single night. I mean, whether it's Zay Flowers, OBJ, I mean, Nelson Aguilar, um, he's been great this year. Let's let's get that out the way. Nelson Aguilar has been really, really good this year. And it's crazy to like kind of hear his name be brought up when you talk about, oh, touchdown by Nelson Aguilar. It's like you hear that more and more often. And like, yeah, you heard it a little bit, um, you know, and when he was with his previous team. Um, but L- Lamar has gotten the best out of him so far this year. And I think I think that's the special part about Lamar, too, is just him being able to connect and click with his receivers that he has now that he has some players that can make plays, right? Isaiah likely has stepped up huge when Mark Andrews went out um, and he's having a great year. You saw the touchdown that he had uh, last week in the end zone when, when he mossed uh, the defender and just went up and got the jump ball. Um, so I think Mark Andrews is back. Isaiah likely is is still getting his touches. Lamar's going to throw the ball around and, and, and make his uh, wide receivers get involved early. Now, we know this is the playoffs, and as Miles mentioned, Patrick Holmes still, as of right now, is the best quarterback in the league. There are reports that Joe Thune on the offensive line is probably and might not play for the Chiefs against that front line that the Baltimore Ravens have. What do the Chiefs actually need to do to win? Because it is the playoffs. It's not like it's guaranteed Baltimore is going to win. What do the Chiefs need to do to actually win this game? Hey. You muted, Miles. You muted. You got to stop Lamar. That's the biggest thing, I think. Um, yeah, he's probably going to be the MVP this year, and the way he's conducting this offense, he does. He looks unstoppable. Um, granted, the Chiefs have a really good defense, so it's, it's going to be a nice test. But 
like I said before, we said that about the 49ers and people doubted him then. So uh, for the Chiefs to be able to win, you got to be able to contain him in the pocket. Uh, he's going through all his reads, so you can't say make him pass because he's a really good passer at this point in his career. So if they're able to slow him down and not let him run out of the pocket and can kind of control what they want out of him, because the corners are doing well. The rush is really good. And if you can keep him in that pocket, it could be tough. You put pressure on him like that first half, the, the Texans kind of, they didn't give a game plan, but it, they gave a glimpse of what you could do if you're able to like mess it up for him, like zone defense, blitz him a little bit, get him off kill. Um, yeah. So we'll see. I think, I think, I think that's definitely where you got to start, right? Like if, if you're the chief's defense, it's how do we make Lamar uncomfortable? It's not by getting pressure out of him because we see what he does with pressure, right? He he's very agile. He escapes the pocket, and then that's that's when your, your defense becomes screwed. I think for for the Chiefs, it's making sure that you keep him in the pocket, right? Make sure that he's not buying time with his legs outside of the pocket because then the defense starts to overcommit. Um, you know, they don't stay with their assignments because they're afraid of what he can do with his legs, and you know they try to go make a play. And, and meanwhile, Lamar's sitting here, you know, making you look silly, juking you in every which way. Um, and then, you know, just making you and turning you into a highlight reel on the offensive side, though, Miles brought up a good point, right? If, if Thune is, is not going to play, you know, the chiefs need to get the ball out of Mahomes' his hand quickly, right? Cause you know, like Greg said earlier, the Ravens are a very good blitzing team. They're disciplined. Um, Patrick queen has, has been awesome this year and he best believe he, he's looking to make, uh, Pat Mahomes is uncomfortable, so they got to find a way, especially with with the receivers not playing up to par all season. They got to find a way to utilize Pacheco in the screen game, get the run game going, so that it's not all on Patrick Mahomes. Um, get Clyde Edwards involved when when he's in there. Um, you know, he had a few big plays last week um, when he came in for Pacheco, but I think the key is going to be for for them to establish a run game early and get the ball out of Mahomes' hands quickly if they're passing. They got to stop. They got to stop the run if the Chiefs are going to win the game. I think that's the key. Uh, they can stop the run, which they didn't do last week, and, and the Ravens have more than one way where they can hurt you running the football, whether, whether it's Lamar or whether it's the, the 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 rookie that they got. I think it was a Keaton. I think it's his last name. Um, he, he's he, – or Keaton Mitchell is his, is his name. I think his name is. Um, but you have him. You have Gus Edwards. You have, you know, just a bunch of ways they can hurt you running the football and Lamar and – so you really got to be cognizant of the run game, read option, the the just the variance and run and the run plays they can throw at you. And then Lamar is just better from the pocket. If you have him, if he has you in thir like third and five, third and short constantly. He's going to pick you apart now. It's not like he's throwing a bunch of scrubs and he's become a better po pocket passer and better at reading defenses from sitting in the pocket. So it, it's going to be a tough, it's going to be a tall task. The Chiefs' defense is their strength, I think, right now. But outside of having Mahomes, so the, it's it's they're up to it. But they didn't stop the run at all last week. They really didn't. The Bills controlled the game on the ground um, and still found a way to lose because that's just what they do. But the Ravens won't give you the game. They won't do that. Justin Tucker is not going to miss a field goal when it comes down to it in crunch time. So it'll be interesting. Um, it'll be really interesting to see how it all goes. But I think they have to stop the run to even give themselves a chance at all. To, to Greg's point, Keaton Mitchell is out on injury. They had Justice Hill, Gus Edwards, and they signed Dalvin Cook. And Dalvin Cook even got 20 yards rushing last week. So they go and mix it up. He had eight carries. Gus Edwards had 10. Justice Hill had 13. And Lamar had 11 himself on honey. Uh -huh. So that, <laughs> that's a balanced attack right there. They don't have to have a, a McCaffrey, for example. They're doing it by committee, and everybody is getting pretty much busy. Five yards for Justice Hill per average, four for uh, Gus Edwards. Dalvin Cook only had eight attempts, so he had about three yards of carry, but still, they get into it. On the flip side, now you got the good old 49ers with Brock Purdy, which a lot of people didn't like that take about Brock Purdy and Jordan Love. And uh, <laughs> they were going crazy on YouTube saying how much uh, Greg ain't know what he was talking about. Yeah, but in this game, in this game, right? Who do you trust more to get you to the Super Bowl, Brock Purdy or Jared Goff? Now, 
before y'all <laughs> answer, I'll throw this out there for y'all. Jared Goff, we know, has issues when pressure is upon Jared Goff. The 49ers did not get one sack last week. The Joey, not one sack, and obviously the Chase Young uh, era has not turned out to be well, and there already talks about let him go in the offseason. So if they can't get pressure on Jared Goff, which the Lions have one of the top three, five offensive lines, who you trust more to get you to the Super Bowl? For me, it's golf. Go ahead, Miles. No, no, you go ahead. I want to hear this. Yeah, for for for, for me, it's golf. And if if we're talking, I'm, we're not talking about who's the better team, right? I think I think the 49ers are the better team, but the quarterback I trust more is Jared Goff. And the reason I trust Jared Goff more is because I've seen what how Brock Purdy struggles without some of the stars around him, right? When the run game's not not going and he's forced to sit back in the pocket and make all these throws, you know, sometimes he struggles pushing the ball downfield, right? When Debo Samuel's out uh, and, you know, he he doesn't have a wide receiver at his disposal, Ayuk's out, right, or or uh, Trent Williams is out and and key players are out that – uh, affect how he he plays the quarterback position. He doesn't look he doesn't look great. Not saying he's a bad quarterback, but he doesn't look great. We've seen Jared Goff go to a Super Bowl since he's been with the Lions this, this past year. At least he's played at an exceptionally high level. Him and Amon uh, Ross St. Brown have an amazing connection. The run game is going, and he, despite him, you know, turning the ball over here and there, I can live with that because you know he's playing with a competitive spirit. He he's making the right throw. He's driving his team down. The, the field to score touchdowns. And I think with, with Brock Purdy, you know, the game that he just played against uh, the, the Green Bay Packers, he didn't look good the first three quarters. That was their game to, to lose. The Packers should have won that game. Jordan Love threw a stupid interception at the end of the game, but they had all the momentum um, really in, in throughout the entire game. And, and Jordan Love was the better quarterback in that, in that moment, in that game, 100%. So, um, Brock, Brock Purdy is a really good quarterback in this league, but in this game, I'm, I'm going with the Lions. I'm going with Jared Goff. Miles, you know what I'm going to say, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say. You know I'm going to say that I, I, I trust uh, I trust Jared Goff more. I know what Brock Purdy's numbers have been. I know he's been good this year. I know he probably deserves a little more respect than maybe I've given him. But I, I still believe Jer uh, J Jordan Love's a better quarterback than him. I still believe that 100%. He's more talented. Um, he's more talented. They, I think his football team relies on him to do more than than, the, than they rely on Purdy. Uh, then, then, you know, I just think that's – I just really do believe that. I think that the 49ers are good and it's a function of the, the collection of talent they have at the, at the skill positions all around. You know, if Debo Samuel doesn't play next, this weekend, they're going to lose. If he doesn't, play, he's gonna probably play. If he doesn't play, they're gonna lose. I'm just, I, I, I'm just being honest. I mean, I, I, I'm just being real. Like maybe, maybe this guy Bert Purdy is legit, and I'm just missing it. But I watch. I know what I watched last week against the Packers. The 49ers should have lost last week. The Packers had three opportunities um, when they were up by what? Up by what? I think it was three or four points. I think it was like 21, 17, whatever. It was. Easily lost, bro. Yeah, like they had three opportunities in the red zone, and they, they, they pissed it away. They pissed it away each time. And I know you could see, you could use that as a knock on Jordan Love. They, they really played against a great defense. I'll give them that. Like they, they, I'll give the 49ers that. Again, they are skilled everywhere, all over, all over the place. They've got great players all over the place. They got Hall of Famers on their on their roster um, at the skill position. McCaffrey, Fred Warner is gonna be a Hall of Famer, in my opinion. I don't care what anyone says. Trent, Trent Williams. So, like, come on, like that's a tough team to go up against in in, in that regard. But Love still made plays. And he's, he got a little reckless at the end. Um, but I think he's a more talented quarterback than Purdy. And I, I don't think he's even close um, in terms of talent. And I and I, and I I think that Jordan Love ultimately will be the better quarterback when it's all said and done. But, again, I mean, that's up for debate. You know, I, I Love did lose, and Purdy's moving along. Purdy's moving on. But, yeah, I, I would take Goff. I, I think Goff's playing good football. Uh, I think he's gotten there before. He's been in the Super Bowl before. It has to mean something. The moment's not going to be too big for him. Uh, I know it's a road game, and, you know, and I know he's he has his moments where he doesn't look so good, and if they get the pressure on him, it can, it can get a little weird. But like you said, Chase is over there just collecting a check uh, and not really, you know, showing up, and so we'll see what happens. And plus, it ain't like Nick Bosa is, you know, chasing a black quarterback, so he's not going to be half as motivated to go put the guy on the ground. 
Oh my gosh. I can't believe you just said that. Oh my goodness. And and, and to your point, just just to add, <laughs> yo, you can whew. Yo, if you look up the stats, you gotta see Nick Bosa's stats versus black QEs. Oh, Chris, versus- cut them off, cut them off, Chris. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, let, let, let me let me take the mic real quick. Nah, but I think I think one thing that we didn't mention about Jared Goff is He's got a chip on his shoulder. So, bro, ever since he got traded to the Lions, so many people have counted him out. And I feel like he feels like he's forgotten about. You can feel it in – or you can hear it in his, his post-game pressers, right? Um, when he just talks about, like, his mentality and kind of how he attacks each game, you know, he he feels like people don't give him the respect he deserves. And I feel like Brock, Brock Purdy – probably feels the same way to an extent just by people saying that he's a system quarterback and he fits into Kyle Shanahan's system, um, you know, based off of all the talent that they have around him. But there's a real level of disrespect that I think Jared Goff carries with him every single time he steps out on that field in terms of how he wants to show up and how he wants to make people believe that he can still be uh, live up to the, you know, how high he was drafted essentially. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I hear I hear what you're saying about Jerry Goff and all that stuff, but I just don't trust him on the road against this defense. Like he's had the comfortable confines of Detroit the last two weeks, so of course he's going to play well. He doesn't play bad at home. That's kind of his mo. Playing in the dome too. Um, and who knows? I don't know what the weather's going to be like in San Fran. If it, it rains again, like it did last week, that could bring him some trouble. But I honestly trust Brock Purdy a little more than him, especially if Debo plays. I think they really don't ask Bert, uh, Brock Purdy to do too much. Like he plays within the system. They ride McCaffrey. They give it to Debo in space, and he really does a, a good job of getting it to his playmakers and letting them do the work. So I kind of trust him a little more. And this defense is incredible for San Fran. Like. Yeah, I think the pass rush will be a little better this week compared to last week. I mean, Jordan Love, I think, is better than Jared Goff at this point um, coming off that hot streak he had during the season. So I think this will be a good test for Detroit to see where they are, but I just don't see them winning. And I don't see Jared Goff really having a great game. I think he might have a touchdown, a couple picks, but – if you get a little pressure on him, he's not that good. Like for a guy who was the number one overall pick, you would expect him to be able to like lead his team a little more in these situations. But I just don't – there's no trust. And I feel like that that goes a long way. Like I, Detroit trusts him. Like they have no other choice. They, you know, they're not going to put Hooker in there. But um, it's – it's not a good look for Jared Goff if he he blows this game. I know they're an, they're an up and coming team, but like they traded for you, you're a number one overall pick. I know San Fran's the best team in the NFC, but this is your time to shine. I just feel like he's gonna let people down again. You know what's crazy though? We view Brock, Brock Purdy differently if Debo plays or if he doesn't play. Right. If Debo plays, we're talking about Brock Purdy in a more positive light. If he doesn't play, we're saying, okay, you know, Brock Brock Purdy may struggle because we've seen him struggle in the past when Debo was out or when when Ayuk was out and or you know McCaffrey was out. Right. It, at some point, we gotta we gotta view Brock Purdy as, as what he is, and we can't say, hey, if he has all of his playmakers, he'll be fine and, and we'll trust him more. It's like, do you trust Brock Purdy without Debo? And if the answer is no, then you got to go with golf. I mean, clearly they do. He led them on a game. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. No, I trust him regardless. I mean, we saw what he did on that last drive to win the game. Like, he went down the field, made plays, hit Kittle, Ayuk, even I think Jawan Jennings a couple times too. So it's not like he desperately needs Debo. Like, they need Debo. He's one of the best playmakers in the league. Don't get me wrong. But, like, I think Brock Purdy – he does spread it around regardless of who's there and who's not. So he's still got Ayuk, who's been one of the best receivers in the league. You still got Kittle, who's one of the best tight ends in the league. And then, yeah, if Debo's out, you're going to have to utilize McCaffrey a little more. That's where you kind of see the 20 carries, maybe like five or six catches out the backfield. So 
I don't I don't want to keep using that excuse that like if someone's not playing, he's downgraded a little bit. Like, sure, you could do that for anybody. Like, you're gonna downgrade uh, Jamar. Well, you're gonna downgrade Burrow a little bit if T Higgins and no, you're not. Or Chase are out. Yeah, he's not doing what he's doing. You're not. No, you're not. He's not doing what he's doing without those guys. Wow. But yo, shout out Panay Panay Sewell. He's in the NFC Championship game. Oh, here you go. Oh, you act like the the, the, the funny thing is when Miles does this, he acts like the Bengals haven't already been there. He look, yo, Penny Penny Sewell. If 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 he was better, we would have drafted him. You know, he could have been there two years ago. You know what I'm saying? Congrats what, to him. First, first team all pro this year, right? Con- congrats to your boy. Before we go on, what's y'all picks? Y'all official picks for the Super Bowl? Who will be in the Super Bowl? After this weekend, oof, it should be 49ers, uh, Ravens, but I don't know. I have this feeling like it, it feels like when Tom Brady and them, I feel like Mahomes can get the win and bring them back to the Super Bowl. So we might have a repeat of Chiefs 49ers again. So I'll say Chiefs 49ers. Uh, I'm gonna go Ravens. Uh, 49ers, and this this is Lamar's one shining moment. This is a big deal for Lamar, and it's not just a big deal for Lamar; it's a big deal for Black people. I'm <laughs> yo, Miles, yo, Miles kills me, bro. Get, get get that thought off. Yo, it's a big deal for Black people, bro. I'm not I'm not kidding. I I think this is a big deal because I, look, I'm gonna call it like it is. And I've heard a couple people on national TV say this. So you know it's like a thing that's out there. Like people really feel this way. Lamar, Lamar Jackson winning a Super Bowl is a bigger deal for black people than than Pat Mahomes winning a Super Bowl for was for black people. Does that make did, did that come out right? Did it come out clear? That did that that sound good? Like did it, did it good? Because it 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 yo, for Lamar Jackson to win a Super Bowl, when he came out of college, we were talking about how or people were talking about how, well, excuse me, white people were talking about how he should play a different position. He should be a wide receiver. He should be a corner. He should be this, anything but quarterback. And then we had the girl, uh, the woman, excuse me, last a few weeks ago and on the Cleveland radio station talking about he not quarterbacky enough, which is funny. He was too quarter blacky. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, I really, it's, it, I really urge people to really think, dig deep here and think about how big of a deal it is for a quarterback like Lamar Jackson to win a Super Bowl with that play style, you know, with to run, to be a, a not, at one point to be run first, to develop his passing game, but still be a guy who beats you with his legs and beats he's a true dual threat. Um, and then on top of that, it the image is different. Like the image is different, guys. I can't I can't sit here and, and fake the you know fake it with you guys. I can't fake it. I'm not gonna be political. The the image is different. Okay. Pat Mahomes under under any circumstance Right. As we look at him today is more palatable to white people than than Lamar Jackson is. He just is. He just is everything about him from Texas. You know, you know, biracial. He's black, but biracial, um, you know, to, to every everything, you know, who, everything about him it, it is more palatable to the white person. Lamar Jackson winning a Super Bowl. Y'all going to see just how racist people can be, bro. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there are people rooting like heck to make sure that he does not, you know, win this weekend. I'm, I'm just, and and it's for obvious reasons. Okay, when you hear the quarterback statement in the year that he's had, where he's improved his pocket passing so so drastically with, with the with the weapons they brought in, for her to have the the gall to say that about him this year, you tell me what it is. You tell me what else it could be besides what I'm insinuating it is. Right now, I don't even gotta say it. You know, so it. it it's a big deal, man. Like it really is. This this quarterback can really change this course around young dual threat quarterbacks like a Jaden Daniels, like you know, and other guys who come up who look who play like Lamar and look like Lamar. It, it's a big deal for the race in terms of football. We contextualize it in terms of football and these quarterbacks playing the quarterback position. It, it pushes it pushes that dialogue forward so many years. It matters. I'm I'm just being real. I'm just being real, man. I mean, I don't know how y'all feel about it. You saw you saw Miles. <laughs> you saw Miles start laughing. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I want to get that off my chest because it's a very big deal. And um, 
I don't, I haven't heard too many people take that angle on it, but it, it's something people should think about. It is, it is. Yeah, I think you're hundred percent spot on. I mean, not much to say other than what you said. I mean, frankly, I wasn't thinking about it like that until you made the analogy the other day when you were texting us about Patrick Mahomes. But once you start to think about it, it's like, you, you got a valid point. You got a valid point. A lot of people, and we, we've seen it in years past, a lot of people look to hate Lamar because he he's a running quarterback, right? And uh, for uh, for other obvious reasons that you, that you were insinuating and, and thinking that white quarterbacks are superior to to black quarterbacks, right? Yeah. That's been a narrative for, for a long time is, you know, white quarterbacks that are, uh, you know, sit in the pocket in our, you know, natural pocket passers are, are superior to black quarterbacks who – may look to use their athleticism more to have the advantage. So look, man, I think, I think everything you said was, was well said and articulated and couldn't agree more. Oh, bro. Yeah. You, bro. I mean, it's yeah. like the, it's like the Brown paper bag test. Like when you look at it, Mahomes, he's a little lighter. So of course America's going to favor him. And a little. <laughs> I was trying to be generous, you know, <laughs> Thanks for cutting me off. But, um, yeah, Lamar, Lamar. Mahomes is lighter than Lamar. I think I said that right. So when America's rooting for a team, of course they're going to try to root for the Chiefs. And then they got Taylor Swift now. So that adds on to white America's choice for who they want in the Super Bowl. And, yeah, Baltimore just represents a different demographic. Like even the city of Baltimore, like hmm. it's predominantly black over there. So Lamar, he has a lot on his shoulders right now, and it's not too much pressure. I feel like he's kind of at ease and at peace with where he is with his game and where he is in the season. Like he knows that this is a great team, and he knows that this is probably his best shot right now to win a Super Bowl. Because the defense is elite, offense is playing incredible. But like you said, the team that most people are going to root for that aren't black is the Chiefs. I, I mean, that's the given at this point. So, yeah, Lamar has a lot riding. He's got black America on his side. I mean, you, you see it on Twitter. You see it on the talk shows. Even uh, what's the quarterback on Get Up? Oh, Dan? Uh, the guy who was on the Lions. Oh, Dan Orlovsky. Orlovsky. Even he pointed it out earlier in the week how this is such a big thing as pertains to, like, the future of the position. Like, if he succeeds, like, he's not – like he said, people that look like Lamar aren't supposed to succeed, which is funny that it's still a thing. And it, it, we have so many black quarterbacks in the league that um, – I didn't even know he said that. No, he did. He said it on uh, first take. And it was like, Look like it's I'm not even mad at what he said because it's the truth. Like People view quarterbacks like Lamar and his style and the way he looks and the way he talks. They're like, all right, he's supposed to be like this video game character. Like, you know, the Michael Vick commercial where he's able to <laughs> – you're able to play like Michael Vick and do all this stuff. That that's not supposed to be the guy that you see on like Super Bowl ads or playing in a Super Bowl. You're supposed to be like the fun guy that you use in Madden who um, uh -huh. you can increase his speed and then you're just running all over the place. You don't even have to pass. You, that was a thing on Madden back in the day. You just pick the Falcons because Michael Vick was the fastest guy on the field, but you're not picking him to win the Super Bowl. Uh -huh. So there's a difference. So, I don't know. This is this is gonna be an interesting matchup. And I mean the dialogue on this matchup has been interesting to say the least. But I'd love to see Lamar get it. I mean, Mahomes, he's gonna be here every year. So it's not like he can't get one next year. I don't wanna like put it like that. Like, all right, just let Lamar have it. Like he's gonna earn the Super Bowl if they get there. Like he's worked hard, he earned the contract. That most people said they sh he shouldn't get. Um, so yeah, this is this is a great moment in the NFL. Like this game is 
huge. Yes, it is. And I, and I told our, <laughs> I told, I told, I told our Ariana the other day when I was talking about this, I was like, Lamar winning a Super Bowl is going to hit different than hit way different as a black person than it did when Mahomes won his and, or the multiple that he has, uh, you know, like, look, you see the image, you just still shot right there. Your boy with uh Kodak black, you know, he, he, look, Pat Mahomes going to be caught dead with, with Kodak black. You wouldn't be caught dead with him. So, I, you know, you know, Batman Holmes is liable to, is more liable to be at a, a what was the name, a, a Rascal Flats concert or something like that, or, or or what's the name, what's the what's the dude's name, yo? What's my guy's name, yo? What's my guy? Chris, Chris is my favorite country artist's name, yo. What's my guy? Oh, oh, my that's my guy, yo. But he's not, he's he's likely more likely to be over there than be with a guy like Kodak Black. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, or you know, and you know, you know what I'm getting at. So this is like you and Miles, you said it in the chat. This is like corporate America versus like, you know, up, uh, you know upstart business like you know pick you up by your bootstraps type situation i'm not saying that you know mahomes didn't work for everything he got he is he is the greatest quarterback i've ever seen in my life patrick mahomes is the greatest quarterback i've ever seen in my life i enjoy watching him play every time he goes out there but at the end of the day this is a big deal for black people of lamar can pull this off like it really is and he's impacting generations upon generations if he can win this super bowl with his play style uh because we're gonna have less questions about those guys in the future i don't know this kind of feels like if Allen Iverson had ever won a, a, a NBA championship where like the way people viewed him and mm -hmm. the braids and the tattoos on the neck and the way he dressed and all that stuff, people kind of tried to develop this image about AI that wasn't true. Like even the whole practice thing was blown out of proportion. Right. But um, you see how people view him mm -hmm. compared to like, let's say a Joker or a Dirk, or you could rattle off a, a bunch of names, John Stockton, Steve Nash, they all have different narratives around their names. So hopefully this Super Bowl, if Lamar gets it, it does change the narrative on quarterbacks that look like him and play like him. Because then you see guys like Jalen Milrose in college and – He's yeah. I'm not. You, you, know, <laughs> you like, might just he might just be ass. <laughs> <laughs> but it opens more avenues for quarterbacks like Lamar yeah. to be able to succeed. Because even before Lamar, you had like Pat White and you had Michael Vick and you had guys like that who did run a lot. And your first thought is like, all right, that would make a great receiver right there. But Lamar showed like he you can succeed with this style of play and. He's got two MVPs to, you know, kind of back that up. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, Lamar, talking about success of quarterbacks, one quarterback where he has a lot of potential, and by all means, you see it every other week. You think he's a top five quarterback? Well, he should. He has the talent to be, but they haven't had the success. I'm talking about none other than Jay Herbo. Jay Herbo has a new head. Coach and Jim Harbaugh, do y'all think old Jimmy boy can get the most out of Jay Herbo and his Chargers team? I mean, if anyone was going to do it, it's him, right? I mean, we saw what he did with Kaepernick, what he did with Andrew Luck back in the day with Stanford, and even getting the most out of J.J. McCarthy, even though like he didn't ask him to do too much, he was able to – to succeed and he's probably going to be a first round pick so he's a, a great developer of quarterbacks like he played quarterback in the nfl for over 10 years so of course he knows the position in and out and he's a great coach like he showed it by a super bowl appearance with the 49ers and he won a national championship last year with michigan so it's going to be interesting to see if someone can finally figure San Diego, LA Chargers out, whatever. I don't even know where they are at this point. But um, this team has been like on the precipice of the next step. Like they're right behind the Chiefs, I feel like, if they had the right coach. Like they've had so many instances, like even last year in the playoffs where they were up like 28 nothing at halftime to the Jaguars and blew that lead. Like that's one of those things that doesn't happen. That wouldn't happen under Harbaugh. Like he, he's a good coach. He's gonna make the right decisions. He's gonna bring in the right coaches for this team. But they've got a lot of decisions to make. Like 
they're right up, up against the cap. Like they're going to have to get rid of Khalil Mack at some point. Keenan Allen might be a cap casualty. Mike Williams. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do in the draft and free agency to develop this team. But I feel like this could be something that turns around pretty quickly with Jim Harbaugh. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I saw the, 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 the poll that Tom posted and it was, you know, it, or the, the, I guess it was the question at the poll where he was just like, yeah, like, you know, if, if the Chargers don't, under, don't succeed next season, you know, or don't make the playoffs, whatever it may have been, you know, will, will Jay Harbaugh be out of there? Will, you know, will his time run out? And a lot of people said yes. And I'm just sitting there like, have y'all watched this guy play football? <laughs> Never been the problem. Like, what? <laughs> you know how hard it is to find a quarterback that's that good? Like, oh, my. Take it from a guy who has to who has to deal with Daniel Jones being on his roster. It, it is it is really, really hard to find a guy that good, that talented. Uh, he's not going anywhere. He, he, but I'll tell you this. Harbaugh will be out of there before he is. If they under if they underperform, I'll tell you that right now, right now, if Dak can keep his job in Dallas for all them years, Her, Herbert, you're talking about Herbert getting out of there. You, you know how much more talented Herbert is than Dak Prescott. Like it's not even close. It's not even close, yo. Like it's not even a conversation. So the the fact that we've been talking about this is, or that we've even, and I know we we it's a tone tone tone's messy. I see what tone did. It's smart. Um, but it, it's good. Like, it, it's good to stir up the conversation. But, I mean, in all seriousness, I think that Harbaugh is going to do a great job over there. I, and I think Miles' point is the thing that people kind of – I think it's kind of underrated about him, his ability to um, – his ability to connect with quarterbacks, to speak their language, to get them late, to play for good football, reduce turnovers, and really play to their strengths and, and or play to the team's strengths, right? What he did with J.J. McCarthy was playing to the team's strengths. If you can get your quarterback to buy into running the ball 50 times a game, he's really going to throw the football – and you know it's going to affect his draft status, then you, you're a special leader of, of men. So I, I, I really like what they've Ooh, done. I love that. I love that point. That's great. Yeah. I think if you can get your quarterback who who has first-round football, first-round talent and could have gone to another school and probably be top, in the top 10 conversation off the rip because he's talented enough to make all throws, but you get him to buy in or to hand the ball off to some little light-skinned dude over and over again, Oh man, that's that's special leadership, bro. That's that is generational leadership. He is a culture setter wherever he goes. Harbaugh, so he's gonna have success. He's gonna have success. We're gonna see some Chargers, Ravens, AFC championships. I believe it. Um, the the I think the choking. The, you said the, Chargers, Bengals. Uh, <laughs> I was making sure I heard you correctly. And, and Bengals, though, no, I have a lot. You know how I feel about Joe Burrow. So yes, and him too. And, like, he's plenty of battles. Plenty of battles between all between all these great teams: Bengals, Chiefs. Uh, Raven. So, yeah, I think you know they got the the right dude. They got the right hire, and I think he's said these are exactly what they need to change the culture there. Because for the longest time, the Chargers were known for ch for choking and squandering leads. I think now they're going to be a smart football team, a disciplined football team that knows how to win and, and understands what it takes to win and puts that first. And so I, I'm excited about watching them play. And I I love Herbert in his game. I think he's going to just blossom. Yeah, and it's a full circle moment for him. I know Chris going to go full circle moment for Harbaugh. He actually played. You mentioned he played quarterback. He played quarterback for none other than the San Diego Chargers at the time. Now they are the L.A. Chargers. But go ahead, Chris. You got it. Well, that video tough. Nah, man. Nah, look, these two hit the nail on the head, man. I'm, I'm, I'm happy for Harbaugh. I'm happy he he made a decision to come back to the NFL. I think that that Super Bowl was, was haunting him. But um, the pairing with with Justin Herbert, I think that's gonna go really well. I mean, Justin Herbert has been a great quarterback in, in the league the past few years. But when you look at Justin Justin Herbert, you you always think like, hey, what what if he had you know a better coaching staff around him, right? Because like, or, or what if what if the team. Uh, was better around him because it, it was never it never Justin Herbert's fault as to why they weren't in games. You'd see Justin Herbert go down the field, right, take the lead, and then you know the defense would would let him down in terms of you know blowing points, and now they lost the game. Justin Herbert can can make throws in the tightest of windows. You can you know what he does with his legs when he gets outside of the pocket. And and the one thing that about Justin Herbert, man, tough as nails. He is tough as nails. The hits that he takes, the beatings that he takes, and for him to stay in the games, come back. Um, not miss games, um, play play with, you know, 
dislocated fingers and just stay out there and sling the ball. We, we've all seen him time and time again drive drive the ball down the field and, and put points on the board. So um, Jim Harbaugh is definitely going to get the best out of him. I love what Greg said about him being a generational leader and a leader of men and getting players to buy in. Not that Justin Herbert was, was ever selfish. You know, you rarely hear Justin Justin Herbert talk. Um, even, even in postgame pressure, is never a negative thing to say. He's someone that seems like he buys into the, the culture and um, – you know, he, he represents football the right way in terms of what, what everything is about. So I think uh, those two are going to hit it off. It, I would have a hard time imagining that Justin Herbert didn't have uh, maybe not influence like a Tom Brady would have in terms of hiring the, the next head coach. But I'm, I'm I have a hard time believing, you know, management and, and ownership didn't run it by him that this is the direction that they wanted to go in and, and see if he was on board. So uh, hopefully he's excited and fired up to get a guy in there that he wants. I mean, he was the best coach on the market, though. That was the other thing, too. Like, I feel like you don't just find a guy who's won at the highest level like this. Who, yeah. He was, you know, a few plays away from winning a Super Bowl and a few plays away from getting back to the Super Bowl the next year. So it's not like, yeah, that was years ago, seven, eight years ago. But, like, he's a great coach. He's you're not going to bring in Bill Belichick to kind of fix things with Justin Herbert. You're going to bring in a guy who, like I said, he gets along with quarterbacks. He gets the best out of them. I think it was time because he was starting to kind of regress a little bit, Justin Herbert, and it's not really his fault. Like there were aspects of this offense that were kind of wacky. Um, But yeah, I think this is a step in the right direction for them. Like they've been, slowly taking steps back with Brandon Staley and uh, let's be real. He should got fired like two years ago, bro. He, 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 he'd been on the hot seat for a while and people he got been... fired after they lost in the playoffs to the Jaguars. Yes. That was when it should have happened. That was like the worst loss in playoff history at that point. Like nobody had lost from being down that much. Maybe the Texans against the chiefs that one year, but that was pretty bad. It's a blessing in disguise too, right? Like when, when you think about it, Harbaugh wasn't available at that time. So, you know, who knows who, who they would have had now at the helm. And I also don't think he would have left if they hadn't won the national championship. If Michigan lost, I feel like he would have re-upped and came out another year. But, like, he accomplished everything that he set out to do at Michigan. So he's going to go back to the NFL and try to do the same thing. I don't know if – the Chargers are Super Bowl contenders right off the bat, but it is a, a step in the right direction for those people. Not even that, too, bro. I'm a firm believer that, like, he, w- he would have stayed at Michigan if the L.A. job wasn't even open, right? A big part of why he took the L.A. job is because Justin Herbert was there, and we've heard him talk, you know, months ago about how he was a big fan of Justin Herbert, right? People harped on that, and that's why they tied him to L.A. is because, you know, in previous conversations – Every time Justin Herbert's name was brought up, you know, Harbaugh raves about him, about his playing style, about the type of person he is, about how he, you know, shows up, um, you know, just in terms of, you know, showing up and representing the game the right way, like I talked about. So I I, I honestly think, like, hey, if if the Chargers never fired Brandon Staley and this job wasn't even available and and we only are looking at the the jobs that are are available – or were available earlier this week and last week before they got filled, I think he goes back to, to to Michigan because, you know, what was appealing to him was obviously Justin Herbert, but the fact that he's coached in, LA, uh, in California, he's lived in California for quite some time, right? He's a West Coast dude. So I don't think any of these East Coast jobs would have, you know, satisfied him in what he was looking for. Buffalo, maybe. Uh, if he waited a little bit. Oh, you said Buffalo? Yeah. <laughs> I do find it interesting, interesting that he didn't choose to ultimately, you know, even really seriously consider Washington uh, with their with their situation, having, you know, a top two pick and five picks in the top 100 and all the money you know, in the world and cap space. It, it seems like a red flag to me that, you know, he didn't seriously consider them when they have an opportunity to get one of, you know, the top three quarterbacks in the class. Like, it's almost like you – know, and Herbert is better than these quarterbacks, I think, coming out. I don't know about Caleb Williams. I I, I think – Caleb Williams has a chance to be as good as Herbert at 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 a, at a minimum. 
I think. Um, which I, that's that's high praise, by the way, because Herbert's really good. Um, but it, it is interesting that he took this job over it. I, I I did say on the on this pod, I was like, yo, he's, he's probably gonna go to L.A. You know, if if I were him, it's easier to sell my wife on moving to L.A. than it is to move it move to Washington D.C. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So um, it, it makes a lot of sense. This is full circle, and it's a dope it's a dope connection, and it was always in the cards. It's, I'm excited to see what happens here. Yeah, I definitely think before we transition that the the wife did play a factor in it because mm-hmm. he had the Chargers fly fly his wife out, so definitely played a factor in it. His wife was probably not on board. So I'm all, I'm living in no Washington. I'm living in no Atlanta. Nah, what no option. Before we transition, I'm gonna talk about one hire that happened in the NBA. I want to ask Chris because he was not on the show with us last week. Where do you think? The jigsaw killer ends up in Bill Belichick. Jigsaw killer. I don't. I don't think he coaches this year. Uh, I. I truly don't think he coaches this year. The. The only job that he was interviewing for was, was the Falcons position. That was the only team that sought sought out to interview him. He had two interviews early on with with the Falcons. They got him done quickly, and um, you know it was clear early on that he wasn't the favorite. You know when you interview twice with the team, right, um, as quickly as he did. And I'm sure it was because they wanted to, to get it out of the way. It was Bill Belichick, right? You know, it would have been a whole, you know, to do if, if it took a while for, for him to get his interviews. But um, the way that the Falcons were moving and, and just in terms of interviewing multiple candidates, right, I heard that they interviewed 14 different candidates. Look, when, when you when you have the chance to get Bill Belichick, if, if, you, if they were serious about landing Bill, and, and wanted Bill, they wouldn't have interviewed 14 candidates, right? So I don't I don't know if, if he coaches this year. And and frankly, like I can't be mad at teams for for not wanting to essentially hire him, right? Not because he's not a, a good coach, because I do think he's 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 one of the greatest coaches that we've ever seen. And and obviously he's a winner. He knows how to win. But I was talking to my cousin earlier today, like, because he he's a Falcons fan and, and he said he wanted he wanted Bill. I'm like, dude. Bill's 71 years old. The, he has three to five years left. A lot of a lot of these these owners, you know, want someone that is going, and it's not going to work out like this for every hire, right? Some of these hires that we we've seen will be fired in three years, will be fired in the next two years, um, just because teams are are impatient nowadays. But they want somebody that they feel like can grow with them should they work out, right? Everyone wants that Mike Tomlin who's with the organization for for forever um, and has had a history of success. And Bill, Bill's got about three to five years left of coaching in him probably. Um, so automatically he's got to go to a team that's in win now mode and, uh, you know, one to two pieces away. And, and the only other options out there right now are the commanders and, and the Seahawks. And, the Seahawks are are heavily looking at, at Dan Quinn. Um, not sure what the commander situation is, but as of now, and as far as I know, at least it's it's not been public knowledge uh, that they've interviewed Bill Belichick. But I I can't see him going from New England to to wanting to go to Washington and be in uh, you know kind of complete rebuild mode when you only have five years left, right? At, at max, probably. And that's just me speculating how how long he has left. You know, he could coach. Till he's 80, if you know, has it been done before? I don't know. But um, with, with Bill, man, he, he's 15 wins away from uh, passing Don Shula. I, I do think he'll coach again. I just don't know if it'll be this year with the teams that are left, um, with that being the, the Seahawks and the Commanders. Now, put some context out there. 81-year-old Arthur Blank, fellow AARP member, said he wanted to have Bill Belichick, but it was some hoops that they was going to have to go through. From reports that I've read to, a couple of bleach reports came out, a couple things came out on NFL Network, different websites. Arthur Blank wanted him, but everybody knew that Bill Belichick wanted so much power. The people in the GM position, the people in the building, didn't want to relinquish that power to Bill Belichick. You know why? That means they gone. That that's what that means, right? If the the more power you give Bill, that makes your job less secure. If you're in one of those positions, right? If if Bill has all this this power to to call shots and and things like that, 
you know, the organization may may feel like, hey, why, why do I need you if, if I'm delegating all this to Bill and he can do more than just coach, right? So it, it's, it's definitely a job security thing too. And I, I was I heard that on the radio too. Like, yo, the reason Bill may not be getting as many interviews as uh, people think he should or, or you know, how teams should be, you know, you know, jumping at the, at the chance to get him is because maybe maybe his asking price is too much right maybe he he wants to be more than just a coach maybe he he wants all that power and and power's a, a word where you know we we don't know what type of power he he's looking for but when when you've had that power for so long within an organization it's tough to give that up i'm sure it's tough to just be to go from being the gm uh, being a shot caller, being a coach and having everything run and flow through you to just then being a coach and have to, you know, people above you that, you know, are making decisions that you used to make in the past. Right. So who who know and we all know Bill to be kind of uh, hard shelled and, and someone that, uh, you know, doesn't show a lot of emotion. So so who knows? from from that perspective like if if that's what he was really asking for but um uh, I don't doubt that for a second man that you know it's his lack of interviews and lack of interest may come from the fact that he's looking for too much power for too much money I think Kanye said it best he said it in one of his songs no no old man should have all that power so I think that's where everybody's mindset is going towards now we're gonna end off the show with the Bucks. The Bucks fired Adrian Griffin and hired none other than Mr. Mr. Blow a lead, Doc Glenn Rivers. Now, this is this is how the Bucks responded the game after Adrian Griffin was fired. This was their this was their mood right here. Mm-hmm. Seemed real happy. That uh, Adrian Griffin was gone. Now, what's your take on the firing and the hiring of Doc Rivers? I'll start off and I'll just say this and give y'all the floor. The Bucks obviously want to get a lead in the playoffs and then lose. That's why you hired Doc Rivers. They have no desire to actually win a championship. And Adrian Griffin wasn't the problem. I said this before. The Bucks this year, Greg, Miles, Chris. You know what they remind me on defense? The Bucks are Oprah. You get a bucket. You get a bucket. You get a bucket. You get a bucket. Everybody gets buckets because their defense sucks. But y'all have the floor. Hey, hey, let me ask you this before before Greg, Greg and Miles go. We, I couldn't tell from from your text message if if and you had me doing some research too, bro. I, I was out here looking like a fool. Was you serious about the, you, the reason that uh, no, he, you, you thought he got fired? Serious? No, <laughs> bro. You you had I was looking I was looking for that report everywhere, bro. No, I'm like yo, where did Joan get this information? <laughs> he said I was joking. Honest, his wife. <laughs> <laughs> I was joking because I forgot who uh, Gilbert Arenas and Stephen A. alluded to that the firing had to do a little bit more than basketball things. So yeah. I'm assuming just joking for those that want to know what's in the group chat. I joked and said that obviously Adrian Griffin must have been texting Giannis's wife, talking about she, he could really do freak time. Like it was something like that that probably happened that got him up, up, up out of here. But Miles and Greg, I, I mean, Doc Rivers is back in the league, man. The joke was on ESPN. He should have stayed working with his son, honestly. Him and Austin Rivers need to stay out the league. Uh, I think I think it's a red flag you know just for the franchise moving forward I mean you're locked in with Dame and you're never going to be able to trade Dame ever again you know for the value that you got him for in the first place you're never going to get that in return for for a trade and I think in the down the line we could be talking about a Dame trade or like them trying to get off of Dame the Dame um, you know move i i think a lot of this is about uh the players and i think you know when it boils down to it damian lillard is is doesn't defend at all i mean it it almost it almost looks like like he's not even remotely committed to trying to win a basketball game with the way he plays defense um out there and 
I think even if you kept Bud and you didn't hire Adrian Griffin, I think you'd have the same problem if you made this trade. You get rid of a guy like Drew Holiday, who is going to give you everything he has defensively and may have some limitations offensively, I guess, even though he's a very good player. Um, and you bring in Dame, and Dame, we, we, Dame's made big shots in the playoffs. He's a heck of a player, Hall of Fame guy, top 75, yes, but he doesn't defend anything. He just doesn't defend. I mean, I, I think Bolt, I think Jalen Brunson had a 40 ball on his head early in the season, and every guard that seems to see him has a career night. He does not defend, and they don't defend as a, as a unit. Um, and, and also, I'll say this too, because I used to argue with people about this all the time, by Giannis, you know, we used to argue all the time about Giannis's defensive player of the year awards and whether or not, you know, other guys were more deserving with how bridges when he was up for it or what, or AD. And I always, I always used to say that, you know, Giannis is blessed with God given ability that allows him to be a great help defender, but he's not a great on ball defender. And I think it's more important for you to be a, a great on ball defender in today's NBA with the way, with the way the court is spaced out and the, you know, the isolations and the, the pick and rolls and how you can get any matchup you want, by just calling over a screen. I think it's more important you're good and on an island. And I don't think he's a good defender on an island. I think this season, you know, bears some truth to that. He's not a great defender uh, one-on-one. So, but you know, yo, when your best two players don't defend at a high level on ball and you, you don't have a point of attack defender in this, in this modern day NBA high school, it's hard to win a high school basketball game. You don't have a good point of attack defender guys. So I can't even imagine what it's like coaching in the NBA and you can't, defend the point of attack you can't defend the point guard coming down the coming down the the lane trying to make a play you can't you have no chance of defending him because you're the guy you have there just can't slide his feet he just does not play defense so they can fire adrian griffin all they want i don't blame him i think the players didn't respect him which is tough it's you have to have the respect to the players you coach you have to it doesn't matter what age group they have to respect you um i don't think they did when he tried to sub Giannis out a couple months ago and Giannis refused to come out the game that's a red flag. I mean, you, you're done. You were fired then. They just didn't tell you yet. They was working on who they just they, they were just trying to work out the contract details with Doc the whole time. And apparently Doc was consulting the, your boy uh, Griffin the entire time. So he just they just slid him right in there. You know what That's I mean? That's what was nasty work. That's what was nasty work. They knew he was he was consulting Adrian Griffin for the last month, the last two weeks. The GM and the assistant GM was coming down. Not from the office. They was coming down on the court and watching practices. Mm-hmm. You had to know if the GM and the assistant GM are on the sideline watching your practices like you a little child. Yeah, your time is coming up. Doc a little sneak. That's why I said I don't like him getting a job. That's nasty where you was consulting him. And somehow as soon as you get he get fired, he stepped right in and got a contract already ready. That's awesome. Nah. They hired him within moments after his firing. They, I was going to say it took no time at all. It took no time. Black on black crime. It was already done. It was already done. They when they started having him consult him, it, it was over. And I think it happened. It, that also happened uh, to James Bur- Borrego in, in Charlotte a couple of years ago. They had uh, Clifford Steve mm-hmm. Clifford uh, assisting him, and, and he was consulting him. And then they fired him, and Clifford got the job like within a couple days. They announced it. It was the same thing. It's, 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 the, it's the seal of death in the NBA if that happens to you. But, yeah, man, it, it, it's – oh, well, you're going to get paid no matter what. You're going to get paid. you good. You got, I think they got him $4 million a year for four years. So you got, you got about $16 million. It's all coming to you. You're good. And the Bucks ain't winning nothing anyways. So it don't make a difference. They hired Doc Rivers, of all people, to try to get this team over the hump. You kidding me? You might as well just hire – you might as well just – what are we doing? You try, you're just trying to lose. They hired, they hired a roadblock. To try to lead him to the championship, he's a walking roadblock. Good luck. No, I agree. I mean, I feel like all of this was done to keep Giannis happy. I mean, firing Bud. I mean, they were number one in the East last year. So, and a few years ago, they had just won a championship. So, I think they felt like they had to make a move, and that's why they went and got Dame. But I feel like this team didn't really need to make a a move like holiday was probably like the anchor of that defense and now you're kind of seeing a leaky faucet with this defense and they're one of the worst defensive teams in the league so yeah sure blame the first year head coach but also that's on there that's on the bucks fault 
for hiring a first time head coach to coach Dame, to coach Giannis, to coach this team that's trying to win a championship. Like it's kind of the same thing as David Blatt with the the Cavs those year all those years ago. But at least they had the common sense to fire him before they got into the playoffs and all that. So he could, you know, try to take a timeout when they don't have any. Um but yeah, Doc Rivers, I don't think he's the solution. I think he's like a stopgap at this point. But I don't think he's that good of a coach. And like you said, he's blown leads left and right. So yeah, when they get bounced in the first or second round to uh, maybe not the first round, but the second round, they, they'll probably get bounced. Um, we'll see what happens. We'll see if he stays on another year or if he's basically here to finish off the year and, you know, right the ship. Because it's surprising you fire a coach when you're second in the East, almost 20 games over 500. But that that's how you know things weren't going how they wanted it to. Like, they're winning in spite of – the coach, in spite of the defense, like they needed something to, to be shaken up. And Doc was a veteran coach that was available. He was free. He was doing games on ESPN. So it is it is nasty work that he was consulting and he was able to get the job so quickly. It's almost like he was in the GM's ear like, yeah, I, you know, I would do this or, you know, I would do that if I was coaching. But um, – We'll see. I just don't have too much confidence in the Bucks. I don't think they're like that good. I think, yeah, they get away with Giannis and Dame and the scoring and all that. But like the Knicks, we can beat them. There's a lot of teams in the East, the, the Heat, the Sixers. Like nobody should be afraid of the Bucks in the playoffs. And that's a, a bad sign. That, I feel like it was different before they had traded Drew Holiday. Like, that was a team that, yeah, you got Drew Holiday, who's a third option on this team. And I don't know. Now you've got Dame as the second option, but he doesn't really give much effort on defense. And Middleton's working his way back. And Giannis is in and out sometimes. But, I mean, his offense is always consistent. But they're just going to have to outscore everybody. That's the only solution. I mean, the only way you win a chip with Doc is if you add more pieces to it. So let's see what they do at the deadline. Hey, we end off the show. Adrian Griffin called out Giannis for a driving, and I know, I know, I know, Greg, if he was the coach, would say this. He called him out for driving and not kicking. Mm. He said that when he drove, there would be teammates open. Mm-hmm. This was said supposedly in like that players only meeting with him. Nobody knows how Giannis reacted to that. Obviously, he didn't react well to it because he posted a picture day after Adrian Griffin got fired and said, count your blessings. So he's obviously happy that Adrian Griffin is gone. Adrian Griffin also called out Giannis and Dame after a game for exactly what Miles said. They don't bring that effort and that intensity on defense as the leaders. Hopefully, Adrian Griffin gets another job. It seemed like he was doing good in regards of, I'm going to hold my stars accountable. And it seemed like the stars didn't want to be held accountable. And obviously, Dan got enough stuff going on off court that he don't got time for nobody else trying to hold him accountable. He got to worry about other stuff trying to hold him accountable. So, you already know the vibes. If you stay ready, you don't got to get ready. Bench mile, we out. Peace. Peace.